Hi, I'm Brett Jones, and I'm a professor and motivation scientist at Virginia Tech. This presentation provides an overview of the role of emotions in educational settings and answers the questions, what is known about the role of emotions in educational settings? And what are the implications of the research related to emotions for educational practice? I want to start by defining emotion, which is actually harder than you might think. Emotions consist of multiple coordinated processes, including several important components. To explain these components a little, let's pretend that you have an upcoming test and that you're anxious about it. The affective component refers to your subjective emotional feelings about the test, such as the nervous feelings that you might experience. The cognitive component involves emotion-specific thoughts, such as the worry you experience when thinking about the test. The physiological components include peripheral physiological activation and includes things like when your heart starts beating faster from the anxiety or when you start sweating in response to the anxiety. The motivational components include your behavioral impulses and wishes, such as wanting to avoid the test. And finally, the expressive components include any of the ways in which you express the emotion such as your facial expression that shows that you are anxious, or some shaking in your voice when you speak. So this leads us to ask, how are emotions and motivation connected? Well, there are at least three ways in which we can see the links between emotions and motivation. The first are motivation impulses that are specific to certain emotions. An example of this would be the fight or flight response, where you would have the motivation impulse to fight if you are angry, and flight and escape from an anxious situation. Another link is the motivational processes that can precede, trigger, and modulate emotions. For example, if you really wanted to do well in your French class because you were going to France next summer, you'd likely be upset if you were doing poorly in your French class. Finally, emotions can influence subsequent motivational processes. For example, if you really enjoyed solving math problems during class, you'd be more likely to go home and start your math homework right away than if you hated doing math and procrastinated in doing your homework. So here we see that there are connections between emotions and motivations, where sometimes motivation-related beliefs lead to emotions, and other times emotions lead to certain motivations. Now I want to take a look at the different types of emotions. Researchers have tried to classify emotions in different ways. Of course, there's no one right way to classify emotions, but some ways might be more useful than others. In one classification, two dimensions have been used to classify emotions, valence and activation. Valence can either be positive or negative, depending on how pleasant the emotion is, with positive valence including pleasant emotions, such as enjoyment, joy, relief, and relaxation. Negative valence includes unpleasant emotions, such as anger, frustration, anxiety, boredom, and sadness. Activation can either be activating or deactivating, depending on how physiologically activating it is, with physiologically activating emotions including enjoyment, anger, and anxiety. Physiologically deactivating emotions include relaxation, contentment, boredom, and hopelessness. The two dimensions lead to four broad categories of emotions as shown here, where the valence can be positive or negative, and each of those can either be activating or deactivating, which leads to the four categories. So the example of a positive activating emotion is enjoyment. An example of a positive deactivating emotion is relaxation. Examples of negative activating emotions are anger and frustration and an example of a negative deactivating emotion is boredom. This table also shows two different foci, activity and outcome. The activity focus refers to the achievement activities, such as activities that would be experienced during instruction. So for example, during instruction, students might feel enjoyment, relaxation, anger, frustration, or boredom. The outcome focus refers to emotions experienced after an outcome. So after receiving the result of a test, students might feel joy, contentment, anger, or sadness. So given all of these emotions, 
What emotions do students experience? Well, in academic settings, students experience a wide range of emotions. And in fact, students report almost all of the major human emotions in academic settings. Anxiety is the emotion that researchers have studied the most. And it's also the emotion that students report experiencing most frequently in academic settings. Interestingly, students report about the same amount of positive emotions as they do negative emotions. Those of you familiar with attribution theory may remember the three dimensions of causal attributions that play a role in students' emotions. Locus, stability, and controllability. Locus is the location of the cause. The locus can either be internal, within the person, or external, within the environment. Stability refers to the duration of the cause. The stability can be seen as a stable, fixed trait, or something that's unstable, variable, and a state that can be changed. Control refers to the controllability of the cause. The cause can either be controllable, where the person is responsible, or it can be uncontrollable to the person. These causal dimensions are important because they lead to different emotions. Let's talk about how this works. If you succeed and attribute it to an internal cause, then it's likely to increase your feelings of pride and self-esteem. Conversely, if you fail and attribute it to an internal cause, then that can decrease your pride and self-esteem. Stability is related to your expectancy for success, which is how well you expect to do in the future. If you fail, and attribute it to something stable, then you know what to expect because it's stable, and you'll feel helpless because you'll expect to fail again in the future. However, if you fail and attribute it to an unstable cause, then you may feel hopeful that you can succeed in the future. With respect to controllability, if you fail and attribute it to an uncontrollable cause, such as aptitude, then you're probably ashamed and feel embarrassed. Interestingly, if others see you fail, and believe that it's due to an uncontrollable cause, such as aptitude, they'll feel pity for you and be sympathetic towards you. In this case, they may also be willing to help you. Now let's consider the case where you fail and you believe that it's controllable, such as when you don't put forth enough effort. In this case, you may feel guilty that you didn't try harder, and others may get angry at you for not trying hard enough. In this case, they might not reward you or give you some type of punishment. These examples might seem familiar to you. To me, it's interesting that the same student behavior, such as failing a test, can lead to such different personal emotions and emotions by others. Attribution theory helps us understand why individuals and others have the emotions they do in these different cases. Because the research related to emotions in academic settings has been lacking and fragmented, Pekrin and his colleagues have tried to develop a more integrated framework related to emotions and achievement settings. They call this framework the Control Value Theory of Achievement Emotions. And I want to give you a brief explanation of the main points in this theory. The central part of the Control Value Theory of Achievement Emotions is that students experience emotions when they feel that they are in control of activities or when they value activities. Thus, control appraisals refer to the controllability of actions and outcomes and value appraisals relate to the importance of activities and their outcomes. Different control and value appraisals lead to different emotions. I'm going to just read through a list of many of the propositions of this theory. High control triggers joy. Lack of control triggers hopelessness. When control is uncertain and success is anticipated, it leads to hope. When control is uncertain, and failure is anticipated, it leads to anxiety. A successful outcome leads to joy, and a failure leads to sadness. Anticipated success that does not occur leads to disappointment. Anticipated failure that does not occur leads to relief. Attributing success to oneself leads to pride. Attributing failure to oneself leads to shame. Attributing success to others leads to gratitude. Attributing failure to others leads to anger. Competence and positive intrinsic qualities of the action and activity lead to enjoyment of the activity. Lack of activity incentive values leads to boredom. Negative activity incentive values leads to anger and frustration. Most all of these points are consistent with my life experiences 
And I bet that you feel the same way, that you have experienced most all of these as well. Here's a figure that I will use to explain the basic propositions of the control value theory. Here are the emotions that students feel in an achievement setting. As I discussed earlier, there are activity and outcome emotions. You'll note these labels at the top of the figure. And this one indicates that the emotions are located in its vertical column. The box down here indicates that emotions are directly affected by stable factors, such as your genes and temperament. This box shows the control and value appraisals that students might make right before they feel an emotion. These appraisals directly affect emotions. These appraisals are affected by achievement goals and beliefs, as well as factors in the environment, such as instruction, autonomy and competence, goal structures and expectations, and achievement. I will discuss the implications of this theory for instructional practice further after I finish explaining this model. So all these factors affect students' emotions in achievement settings. Now let's consider what happens after students have emotions. Emotions influence cognitive resources, interests and emotion, learning strategies, and self versus external regulation of learning. With respect to all four of these factors, positive activating emotions, such as enjoyment, help learners. For example, positive activating emotions help students focus attention on their learning activities, increase interest and strength and motivation, use flexible learning strategies, and enhance self-regulation. Therefore, emotions affect students' achievement through these processes. More specifically, enjoyment, hope, and pride are positively related to achievement, while hopelessness and boredom are negatively related to achievement. Achievement then acts back on students' emotions and back on the environmental influences. Over time, emotions reciprocally affect achievement through feedback loops where successes can lead to positive emotions and failures can lead to negative emotions. Finally, the boxes down here and arrows 9 to 11 indicate that the appraisals, emotions, and learning can be regulated and treated. So if students are having problems in these areas, there's something that can be done about it. Similarly, this box and arrow 12 show that effective learning environments can be designed. Now let's take a look more specifically at what can be done to design effective learning environments with considerations for students' emotions. Let's consider the question, what are the implications of the research related to emotions for educational practice? Peckrin discusses how instruction and assignments should have positive effects on students' perceived competence, perceived control, and values. He also gives some other implications, including that instructors should foster positive activity-related emotions, meet relatedness needs, be enthusiastic, support autonomy and self-regulated learning, avoid competitive goal structures, provide feedback that students can be successful, provide attribution retraining to effort and not natural ability, and help students self-regulate emotions. Now I want to place these strategies related to emotions within the bigger picture of motivating strategies that can be used by instructors to motivate students. Although there are other purposes of the control value theory than to simply motivate students, the purpose of this video is to focus on the motivation-related aspects of the theory, and therefore, I will focus on those aspects here. The music model of academic motivation provides key motivation principles for instructors to consider when designing instruction. A more complete explanation of the music model is provided elsewhere, such as in Jones 2009 and at the motivatingstudents.info website. But here I want to briefly explain this model and how the instructional strategies related to emotions fit into the music model instructional strategies. The music model states that instructors need to ensure that students believe that they have some control over some aspect of their learning, understand why the content is useful, believe that they can succeed if they put forth the effort, are interested in what they're supposed to be learning, and believe that the instructor cares about whether they meet the course objectives. These five key principles can be remembered by using the acronym MUSIC. I show the five music model components at the top of this figure and design for emotions at the bottom. 
Now I want to place each of these points from the previous Implications for Teachers slide onto this slide to show how the recommendations from the research on emotions relates to the music model. Positively affect control and support autonomy directly relate to empowerment, and in fact they are the definition of empowerment. Positively affect values asks teachers to show students the importance or usefulness of the content, which is directly related to the usefulness component of the music model. Positively affect competence will directly affect students' perceptions of success. The reason for avoiding competitive goals is that competition creates losers, which affects students' success beliefs negatively. Providing feedback for success is directly related to students' success beliefs. And providing attribution retraining teaches students that their effort is important to their success, and their success is not limited by their natural ability. Activity-related emotions include enjoyment, which is included in the definition of interest in the music model. And being enthusiastic is one way to stimulate students' interest. And finally, meeting students' relatedness need will help them to feel that the teacher cares about them. These are not the only implications for teachers in designing for emotions, but they're some of the main ones that Peckrin discusses in his chapter, and it gives us a feel for the types of things that teachers can do. The music model was developed not to create new motivation theories, but to provide an organizing framework for all of the motivation strategies across many different theories, including theories of emotion. It's clear from this slide that the music framework can be used to organize the implications provided here, and hopefully, instructors can begin to see the underlying similarities among teaching strategies. The purpose of this presentation was to provide an overview of what is known about the role of emotions in educational settings. More information can be found in the references cited here. I have links to other information and videos on my website at www.motivatingstudents.info. Feel free to contact me by email at brettjones at vt.edu.